Good evening. I am Monica Ponce de Leon, Dean of Taman College at the University of Michigan. Welcome to the Future of Technology Conference. This is a third of a four-part series of interdisciplinary conversations. As we ponder the present and future of technology in the various design fields that are represented here today, I thought it would be helpful to take a look at the history of design and its anxieties towards technology. Different versions of the many debates currently played out in the design media, in academic conferences, and in our classrooms were rehearsed at the advent of the Industrial Revolution, and revisiting them might shed light on our, on our own present predicaments. As early as 1797, Gotha deliberated the relative merits of handmade versus machine made. In his essay, Art and Handicraft, he argued with artistic content against the value of mechanically produced objects, which he found less pure, not as sensitive, or as true as those who were actually made by hand. It is fair to say that this debate and its moralistic undertones dominated much of the design theory of the 19th century. As technological advances and economic changes fundamentally transform material production, despite their ideological differences, Fusion, Ruskin, Henry Cole, Richard Redgrave, Gottfried Semper, and William Morris, among others, spent their time lamenting that machines had usurped the craftsman's control over the form of the product. They believed that the effect of industrialization had been to change creative practice by separating the responsibility for the appearance of a product, design, from the task of fabricating it, with the consequence that the quality of design had deteriorated. While this is partly true, design as a profession was born out of industrial production's need to separate tasks. What these 19th century critics failed to see is that in fact, most goods at the time were not made by machines, but by repetitive cheap labor. A close look at 19th century practices exposes that the crucial factor in a certain quality is the relationship of labor to capital. By failing to understand the actual means of production around them, and by misplacing their critique, these theorists were unable to productively advance their practices. In my own discipline, architecture, today we see traces of these 19th century arguments about technology and their latent anxieties in discussions regarding the current form of sophistication enabled by parametric modeling and the potential to materialize these forms by digital fabrication. There are many that misunderstand the techniques that are now available to our disposal as merely being automatic, somehow removing the hand of the designer, or rather his or her head, from the act of creation as if software may automatically design. This critique runs the risk of oversimplification as the reality of digital production is more complex and increasingly more sophisticated. It is true that complexity of form in many cases may mask the lack of ideas in a particular project. But I would, I would venture to say that it does so no more than the shades and shadows, the, no more than shades and shadows did for previous generations. The reality is that software, like pencils and parallel rulers, are tools that enable the creation and development of ideas through form. There is a difference between what we can do digitally versus what we can do through pencil and paper. Thus, while the output might differ, the presence of the author in the final outcome is, at the end, for me, no different. Parametric modeling and scripting, for example, are often named as the usual suspects in the automatization of design. In actuality, parametric modeling depends on the user designing form and then crafting the parameters for its variations. A script, by definition, is a computer program language that allows control over software by the end user, the designer. 
They're both tools whose intent is precisely to give us more control over the design. Potentially more troublesome is how in parallel to these misconceptions, the relative merits of technolo technological advances in design and fabrication are currently cast in opposition to social concerns and environmental stewardship. For many, geometric complexity, mathematical precision, capacity to produce variations, in short, our ability to design very sophisticated forms, has somehow gotten on the way of doing the right thing. I would agree that some of the design disciplines, and in particular my discipline, architecture, perhaps have been for too long focused exclusively on advancing certain disciplinary problems. However, by constructing digital technology and its corollary disciplinary advances in opposition to our engagement with the world, one precludes the possibility that form may actually play a vital role in the solutions to our more pressing problems. In this sense, the debates of the 19th century might serve as a good lesson. While architects such as Eugen and Ruskin were arguing about styles in relationship to good craft, a whole building industry was being invented around them. It is in the 19th century that standardization of materials across large geographic areas came into being, forever transforming the way that buildings were produced. The consistency of dimensional lumber or modern brick sizes and, in the, and their implication for construction are very much part of the reality of building today. These techniques were developed without the critical input of those outside the building industry, propelled almost exclusively by economic forces with unexpected societal and environmental consequences. The efficiency of dimensional number dimensional lumber and its ease of assembly, enabled by the widespread use of balloon framing, for example, resu resulted in the boom of the lumber industry. But its unexpected side effect was that two-thirds of the net loss of forests in the United States occurred between 1850 and 1900, only over a 50-year span. Formal concerns played no role in this history. Thus, I cannot help to wonder that if form had been reconsidered in relationship to means of production, different criteria for efficiency might have actually emerged, potentially with dramatically different results. Today, we find ourselves at a similar crossroads. The digital revolution has radically transformed how we acquire goods, communicate, and socialize. Also, it has had a tremendous impact in the way that we design, produce objects, construct buildings, and materialize space. However, the consequences of these techniques have not yet been exhausted. While I am one that argues that architecture, my discipline, at the end is not the most effective tool for changing the world, not like political action or legislation, I do think that objects, built form, and space do have transformative potential. And recent disciplinary advances, advances will precisely become the platform that will enable such transformations. Using architecture again as an example, while in the 19th century industrialization offered the promise of mass production, in building today, the combination of computer-aided design software and digital fabrication offers us the potential for mass customization and a redefinition of craft. The new technology enables us to introduce variation within a single project without added cost, opening the possibility for designing for the many instead, uh, instead of designing for the average few. Formal variation opens up the possibility of engaging multiple publics. Similarly, geometric complexity can enable us to respond to multifaceted programs that require compound solutions. Formal precision permits us to advance mathematical topics, which, has hi which have historically been at the core of the discipline of architecture, but concurrently re-examine traditional notions of efficiency through a broader lens, material, structural, fabricational, economical, cultural efficiencies. 
equally important, the new technologies can afford a level of detail and craftsmanship that throughout the 20th century has only been within the reach of few. Technique and its corollary technology has always, have always been related to architecture. The influence of technology in my discipline is undisputable, but it should not be its only reason for existing. As technological advances change the production of architecture, new form forms of practice are bound to arise that will impact notions of cultural engagement and cultural representation. Think of the transformation already afforded by rapid prototyping and the possibility of modeling more design variations than ever before, not only for our own evaluation as designers, but also giving our clients choices and greater engagement in the design process. In addition, by creating a direct link between the architect means of production, drawing, in this case, computer-aided design, and the means of and the means of producing buildings, digital fabrication, the traditional dis divide between design and making has be that has marked the profession from its inception may actually be eroded and brought into question, thereby appropriating craft for the discipline. I have been using architecture as an example because it is my own discipline, the one that, that is dear to my heart. But I believe that these issues cut across the various disciplines that participate in the construction of our physical environment. The design of garments, for example, underwent a dramatic transformation with the invention of the sewing machine, making elaborate and layered fabrication inexpensively available to the masses, much to the dismay of the 19th century upper class, and forever transforming social codes and definitions of public space. Today, debates about the impact of mass production on environmental degradation and the impact of materials on our bodies are challenging the field of fashion to reconsider technology, as is, in the, case, as is, as is the case, for example, in the work of Linda, Lo Linda Lodermilk. With this in mind, me and the faculty set out to bring together in this conference disparate disciplines that participate and have an impact on the construction and experience of environments. From the design of urban scapes, landscapes, to objects, to buildings, from the virtual to the, to the physical. So the next day and a half is meant to be a brainstorming session among scholars, designers, and thinkers across disparate disciplines, including some that have rarely been placed in the same conversation. We have asked our speakers simply to speculate about the future of technology. We gave them no instructions, no directives, and in a way we have let them uh, go out in a limb. What we're giving them is an open mic. Each speaker gets 15 minutes, and their stream of consciousness will be punctuated by conversations around specific topics. We have purposefully placed around the same table people with divergent points of view, and in many cases, we have placed around the table those that might actually disagree and perhaps not even be experts in the topic to be discussed. The intent is to open new avenues for exchange or to simply shake things up. I'm very grateful to the faculty that gave shape to this experiment by participating in discussions and articulating common ground. I am particularly grateful to Carl Daubman, Joe Grangs, Amy Culper, Jane McGrath, Stephen Mancouch, John Marshall, Malcolm McCullough, Kathy Velikov, and Glenn Wilcox for their intellectual leadership. I'm also grateful to John McMorrow, Chair of the Architecture Program, and Dick Norton, Chair of the Planning Program, for their support. I want to thank Dalman College staff for an amazing organization, for an amazing job in organizing the event, in particular Denise McGee, Amber Lacroix, Alicia Spitnago, and Jeanette Turner, and in particular Jeanette, who has spent the whole morning trying to solve technological problems. I'm also particularly grateful to our speakers for their generosity. Many of them have come from very far to participate, all of them giving us their time selflessly. Thank you. <laughs>